All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Ben Colley Thompson. I'm the um, editor in chief of the Pulse Institute and the dean here at the Academy of Fellows. It is my honor to welcome you uh, this afternoon for what promises to be an engaging, an engaging conversation here this evening with the internationally renowned uh, Rupert Lewis, Professor Emeritus at the University of the West Indies. Uh, be, to, to begin with, I want to invite uh, our president and director of research here at the Pulse Institute, uh, Attorney Tina Patterson. Uh, previously, before taking the helm at the Pulse Institute, she was a federal government attorney for the Social Security Administration, writing the opinions of judges across the United States and in Puerto Rico, uh, a, a committed social justice advocate who uses the law to challenge uh, the vestiges and the remnants of, of, of racism and Jim Crow here on this side of the Midwest, and one of the finest and bravest attorneys to come out of Detroit. Uh, Tina Patterson, the president and director of research here at the Pulse Institute, will give us uh, the opening remarks, and after which we will proceed to the next item on our agenda here this evening. Again, thank you so much for being here, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Thank you, Bankale, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Like Mr. Thompson said, I'm attorney Tina Patterson, president and director of research here at the Pulse Institute. And it is my honor this afternoon to welcome you to the Pulse Institute's literary circle today with our distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Rupert Lewis. Uh, now, for many of you who may be joining us for the first time, the Pulse Institute is an independent, nonpartisan, anti-poverty think tank headquartered here in Detroit, Michigan, the largest black city in the United States. Uh, Pulse is Public Leadership and Social Equity, P-U-L-S-E. So our mission is exclusively dedicated to raising the issue of poverty and equality to ensure policy decisions match the needs of impoverished communities that are often purposefully neglected. The Institute was established because at the time of its founding, Detroit had the distinction of being the largest poverty city in the nation. And despite this unconscionable bearing, a few organizations or entities were willing to place the burden of economic recovery on raising the quality of life for those living under the poverty line, despite glowing reports of economic revitalization in our mainstream commercial corridors. Now institution building as a vehicle for social change is a historical imperative, particularly in the pursuit of racial justice for the global African diaspora, uh, predicated upon truthfully identifying underlying causes of inequality and shaping the narrative that will determine the desired outcome-driven results to achieve socioeconomic equality and the full inherent dignity mandated by basic humanity. This is seen in the likes of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference founded by Martin Luther King Jr., the nation's greatest anti-poverty champion, who led the civil rights movement, one of the greatest social movements in history, spearheaded by the Montgomery bus boycott initiated by Rosa Parks, which actually occurred 65 years ago this week in 1955. Another example is a topic of discussion that our esteemed guest of honor, Professor Lewis, will discuss, which is the Universal Negro Improvement Association, founded by Marcus Garvey, an organization so influential that it had chapters and strongholds around the global African diaspora, and to this day, 100 years later, remains a preeminent philosophy in the quest for racial and socioeconomic parity. The Pulse Institute is honored to walk in the trad tradition of these tremendous organizations that laid the foundation for an entity like ours to exist. Since our founding, we have initiated successful national programming, such as the Academy of Fellows, a sector of the organization that includes scholars such as Samuel Bagentos, Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Administration, of, for the Civil Rights in the Obama Administration and current Professor of Law at the University of Michigan, and Premila Nadison, Professor of History at Columbia University and at Barnard College and the President of the National Women's Studies Association. Individuals like Premila Nadison and Samuel Bagentos, among others, contribute columns on specific policy areas related to poverty, such as housing and taxation, criminal justice reform, and gender justice issues. These columns are published on our website, which offers 24-hour analysis on the latest issues relating to poverty and equality locally and nationwide, as well as internationally. 
Now, because the focus cannot be narrowed only to the world in which we live today, but the world we want to live in tomorrow, we also offer a National Junior Fellows Program where we invite high school students from around the country to participate in engaging leadership and writing seminars focused on anti-poverty policies and how these young people view the world. The Institute is guided by a national advisory panel composed of distinguished global leaders who constitute centuries worth of anti-poverty leadership, including Dr. Bernard Lafayette, national coordinator of the 1968 Poor People's Campaign, top lieutenant to Dr. King and close colleague of the late recently departed Congressman John Lewis, Arun Gandhi, the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi and a global advocate for social justice, Sister Simone Campbell, the executive director of Network and a progressive leading Catholic voice for justice. Herb Boyd, historian and author of biographies on Malcolm X and James Baldwin. Robert Weiner, former White House spokesman. And an honor guest you will hear from soon, Janice Carney, presidential diarist of former President Bill Clinton. Finally, this brings me to today's event, a series we recently launched titled The Pulse Literary Circle. With this series, we focus on authors who have penned critical writings that expose the social injustices of past and present and feature remedial measures to address past injustices, as well as ensure equality moving forward. The series has featured authors such as historian Beryl Satter, professor of history at Rutgers University, and Ian Haney Lopez, professor of law at UC Berkeley. The literary circle's sphere of influence has accumulated a global audience in a short amount of time a testament to the importance of education and spreading knowledge that will uplift, inspire, and most importantly, practically improve the lives of citizens across the world. Malcolm X, prolific orator and philosopher stated best that education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. At the Pulse Institute, we agree with this philosophy wholeheartedly and are honored to share in the mission of education with the Pulse Literary Circle we present to you today. I thank you very much and hope you will enjoy. Thank you so much, Tony Tina Patterson. Again, you're listening here. This is the Pulse Institute uh, National Literary Circle Forum featuring our guest speaker tonight, uh, Rupert Lewis, Professor Emeritus of the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. He'll be speaking shortly. Let me proceed to introduce um, Janice F. Carney, uh, the first presidential diarist in the White House, served in that role from 1995 to 2001 during the administration of former President Bill Clinton. She's a member of our national advisor panel. Janice Carney is an accomplished journalist, writer, publisher extraordinaire on her own, a longtime book publisher and author and journalist. She served for two years as a fellow at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. Through her own writing and her publishing company called Writing Our Wall Publishing, an independent publishing firm, she has written or co-written eight books, including the critically acclaimed Cotton Field of Dreams, a memoir. In 2014, she founded the Celebrate Maya Project, whose mission is to promote the life and legacy of Dr. Maya Angelou, a preeminent writer of the 20th century throughout Arkansas communities and schools. Janice F. Carney is a proud daughter of the American South, and she carries with her uh, the dream and the hopes and aspirations of what uh, Black children ought to be today in affirming that Black Lives Matter. When the Pulse Institute was founded, she was one of those who readily came to the table to lend her name and her credentials to what, has been, what this institute has become today as a national platform. Janice Kearney, for her welcome, the official remarks now. Janice, thank you so much for being here. We'll now let you give the official remarks. Thank you, thank you for inviting me, first of all, Ben Cowley, but also thank you for all the good work that you and Tina and the rest of your group are doing, amazing work. And I just feel very honored to be a part of it in a small way, uh, especially because you're dealing with something that I lived for all of my life before I left home, uh, coming from a family of sharecroppers. So uh, I just love what you're doing. I love that you're challenging the status quo. You continue to do it. I love that you're questioning what is right for all people, not just the people at the top, but all people. So I, I know you will continue to do that. And thank you. Uh, I wanna say to your renowned speaker, Dr. Lewis, welcome. Where I grew up from down in Southeast Arkansas, Pan-Africanism, was a bad word. It scared our parents and it certainly scared the white people there. 
uh, just as Black Lives Matter, do, Matter does to a great extent today. But gratefully, most of us understand that its true meaning is simply, we are human too. And if we don't look out for ourselves, who will? So I thank you for bringing your message, uh, Dr. Lewis, and disassembling this whole thing about Black Lives Matter. I'm looking forward to hearing you talk about that to lay people like myself. None of us will ever be able to look back on 2020 without either a sense of despair or a sense of gratitude, maybe both. And a huge part of that points to our political upheaval, which I know Dr. Lewis, Lewis will address tonight. Much of that upheaval, which I know um, he'll talk about, goes back to our leadership's regard or disregard for others' humanity. His disregard and recognition that each man or woman has the right to vote freely and without impunity. And I know you in Michigan know what I'm talking about. Tell me when Rupert comes on, okay? Yeah, let me. As, as Bankoli mentioned, much of my life has been centered around writing and researching to write. I consider myself a storyteller. Mostly I seek to tell others stories with a bent, meaning I want to learn something below the surface about people we think we know and share this new version with the world. I have a deep, deep reverence for history and historians and the important work you do, not only to help, to help those of us now living understand our past, but for those not yet living so that they will better understand what we are going through and why. And it is our hope and prayers that our past will instruct their future. Between 1995 and 2001, I served in a role that was created by President Clinton, the personal diarist to a president, mostly because Bill Clinton reveres history and also be because he believes that the presidency belongs to the people. And as much as we can, we should share what each pres presidency is about with the people. I was honored to serve in that role sitting just a few doors down from the Oval Office was beyond anything I could have imagined growing up down in Southeast Arkansas as a sharecropper's daughter, but also gaining entrance into places that 99% of the world were not privy to, meeting men and women I would have only read about in another world and learning about the presidency from a front row seat and how that presidency would impact the world. Before, before most of other people learned about it. I wasn't supposed to be there. I grew up on the tail end of the Jim Crow era. My small town had separate schools, separate libraries, separate doctor's offices until I was in middle school. Integration took place in 1967 in Arkansas. Okay. T uh, took place in 1967, 10 years after the famous integration crisis of Central High School, where the Little Rock Nine were allowed to enter the vaulted halls of Arkansas's grandest school. But they paid for that entrance every day that they showed up with beatings, with being ignored by both students and teachers and being ostracized. Laws, as we know, are great. But if man's heart is out of sync with those laws, they can be even more dangerous for those the laws sought to help. So Dr. Lewis, we are so grateful that you are here and so grateful that you will share your knowledge and wisdom about this upcoming presidency. Because of 2020 and all that it wrought, Americans are hopeful in spite of our realities and in spite of what history had, has taught us. We are hopeful because of all we have witnessed in the White House for the past four years. We are hopeful because we have hit rock bottom as far as hope is concerned, watching the number of innocent people die because of willful disregard for humanity. We are hopeful because over the last four years, we have seen just how bad things can really get in this great country. Great because of its possibilities, in spite of what is happening today. It is yet a land made up of people who have always been able 
to find hope in the smallest of blessings. And yes, we are hopeful because we will have a man named Joe Biden as our president come January 20, 2021. But just as importantly, because we will have a woman by the name of Kamala Harris, descendant of the Caribbean, first black and first woman vice president of these United States. So I am excited. I am excited and hopeful. And I look forward to hearing you speak, Dr. Lewis, about the historical exchange of ideas and people between the US and the Caribbean. We, America, is the better for that history. And I thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to ask you all to, if you can mute your buttons, and I'm trying to do that as well. But you know, with Zoom, you have to learn new tech every time. So if you can mute your buttons uh, so we can get this program go in orderly fashion. Thank you so much, Janice Carney, presidential diarist, uh, and of course, a member of the Pulse Institute National Advisory Panel. Uh, my friends, uh, let me proceed now to introduce our keynote speaker this evening. Uh, that is the individual you are here to listen to. Uh, this evening. Uh, in the primer, the wealth of nations, uh, the political economist Adam Smith observed, wherever there is great property, there is great inequality, unquote. The question of closing the inequality gap has been history's most troubling question. In his groundbreaking speech against the war in Vietnam at Riverside Church in New York in 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, and I quote, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thin oriented society to a person oriented society. When machines and computers, profits motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism and militarism are incapable of being conquered. True compassion, King said, is more than that flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth, unquote. Our speaker this afternoon embodies the scholarship and the intellectual force of addressing that question of creating a more just society where black lives matter. His work on Marcus Garvey, one of mankind's greatest philosophers and prognosticators of the human experience to, over, to ever walk the face of the earth is testament to the power of transmitting the substance of history to the next generation. Yes, Black Lives Matter. Yes, Black Lives Matter, and even more so in an age when US Senator Kamala Harris has been elected the first black woman of Jamaican descent to become vice president of these United States. This development encapsulates the significant but sometimes overlooked contribution of the Caribbean world to US politics. Those who have shaped the civil rights movement have had deep roots in the Caribbean, from Congressman Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American to run for president, civil rights icon Malcolm X, whom the, the scholar Manin Marabu referred to as our black shining prince, to our elder statesman and humanitarian Harry Belafonte. The nexus between the Caribbean and the United States is what has led us here this evening. And no one is more equipped to address this nexus and Marcus Garvey's influence on American life than Dr. Rupert Lewis, Professor Emeritus of the University of the West Indies, an international renowned scholar and a first rate academic of the modern era. He's a scholar of the Garvey movement and Caribbean radicalism in the 20th and 21st centuries. His latest book, Marcus Garvey, documents the forging of his remarkable vision of Pan-Africanism. Professor Lewis is currently a research fellow in the P.J. Patterson Center for Africa-Caribbean Advocacy at the University of the West Indies, working with former Jamaican Prime Minister P.J. Patterson to build bridges between the Caribbean and Africa. His work has been so profound that his colleagues published the volume of essays entitled Rupert Lewis and the Black Intellectual Tradition in his honor in 2018. He has been an activist for reparative justice since the 1980s and is a member of Jamaica's National Council on Reparation. For his services to Jamaica, the government of Jamaica awarded him the Order of Distinction Commander Class. It is my honor now to welcome to the Pulse Institute National Literary Circle, Dr. Rupert Lewis of the University of the West Indies. 
Thank you very much, Bankole, uh, for your introduction. Thank you very much, Janice Kearney, for your presentation, which surveys the work you have done, your interest, and your commitment to a just society in the United States and the world. Thank you, Tina Patterson, for your introduction of the work being done at the Pulse Institute, which I respect. Bankole is the one who set the framework for what I'm about to uh, deliver. He, he is my instructor. So <laughs> if there are any challenges I experience, I lay it at the feet of Bankole. Uh, I wasn't expecting to do this topic, but it really intrigues me. That is the Caribbean contribution to the United States. A big topic, but I'd like to welcome also our online participants. Thank you for turning up. Thank you for tuning in and look forward to the discussion with you. We need to remember our ancestors. And today I'd like to remember the Zong. On November 29th, 1781, 239 years ago, 130 enslaved Africans were thrown overboard the slave trading ship, the Zong, so that their owners could collect insurance on their lives. The overcrowded ship left Accra in what was then the Gold Coast, now Ghana, on 18th August, 1781, with 442 enslaved Africans. This was twice the number of people it could accommodate. And due to navigational errors, the ship lost its way and ran short of water. The Zong arrived in Black River, Jamaica on 22nd December, 1781 with 208 enslaved people. 234 lives had been lost. When we examine where we are now in the context of this history, we're all humbled in the face of what our ancestors went through over 300 years, with the fact that over 12 to 15 million Africans traversed the Atlantic slave trade, many of them working and faced severe hardship. So whilst we are in our own moment, we need to have this broader historical understanding of our ancestors and where we are coming from. This tragedy, the tragedy of the Zong, stands not only as a marker of the Hainas transatlantic slave trade, it highlights the fact that from the 16th to the 19th centuries, enslaved African labor laid the foundations for the rapid growth of Western capitalism in the United States, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. That system was reorganized after the Second World War with the dominance of the United States in the world economy. The Bretton Woods system set up after World War II had no representative from Africa and Asia. We have to do the work necessary to ensure that the international system in the 21st century is reformed so that the majority of the world's people are represented and have a say in global governance. What is the connection between Garvey and Kamala Harris? I know the interest is obviously in the vice president elect because she has been a first in many ways, first black woman in this position of power. The obvious answer of the, about this connection is her Jamaican family roots, her Jamaican kinship ties. Marcus Garvey and Kamala Harris are both global influencers, but in very different ways and in different times. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris is the first woman to be selected to this high executive position, African-American. And in her memoir, The Truths We Hold, she wrote, my father Donald Harris was born in Jamaica in 1938. He was a brilliant student who immigrated to the United States after being admitted to the University of California at Berkeley. 
He went there to study economics and will go on to teach economics at Stanford, where he remains a professor emeritus. Of her mother, Shyamala Gopilan, she writes, like my father, she was a gifted student. And when she showed a passion for science, her parents encouraged and supported her. She graduated from the University of Delhi at 19, applied for graduate school at Berkeley and went directly into a program where she pursued a doctorate in nutrition and endocrinology. Many of us at the University of the West Indies at the Mona campus in Kingston, Jamaica and in policy making circles are familiar with her father's work, Professor Emeritus Donald Harris. He spent a year in the 1980s running the consortium graduate school in the Faculty of Social Sciences at Mona University of the West Indies. And each year when he returned to Kingston, Jamaica, he gave seminars on economics. He was an economist who sought to develop Karl Marx's ideas to understand the development of modern capitalism. He was also involved with policy making in Jamaica and was invited by former Prime Minister PJ Pattison in the 1990s to develop export led growth policy for Jamaica. So like many of the parents of children who grew up in the United States, his remittance was a rem intellectual remittance. And it's an area that we don't pay so, so much attention, a lot of attention to because the focus has been on the remittance of cash money. Her parents, Kamala Harris's parents are products of the independence generation in India and the Caribbean, who became involved in civil rights in the United States and the cultural revolution of the time. Kamala Harris describes falling asleep to sounds of jazz greats, Thelonious Monk, Monk John Coltrane, Miles Davis from her father's extensive vinyl collection. She remembers her mother singing Aretha Franklin. Mother apparently had, was known, well, had a good reputation as a singer. Her parents divorced when she was a child, five, seven years old, was difficult. And she talks about her mother's role in bringing up her daughters, Kamla and Maya, and the tragic death of her mother from cancer. I will be commenting on her political role in what will be a turbulent 2021 later on. But my focus is not primarily on the politics of kinship important as that is, but on the significant impact of black political movements in, in the 20th and 21st centuries, which made Kamala Harris's elevation into the second most powerful political host in American politics for the years 2021, 2025. We're living through extraordinary times in 2020, marked by multiple crises. A pandemic accompanied by a severe economic crisis and a pandemic of American and global racism. We are also experiencing an extraordinary challenges of climate change. And in the Caribbean, we feel this directly, Caribbean, Central America, Southern United States through the intensification of hurricanes and the devastation that hurricanes can wreak and have wrought on the Caribbean. These crises have been accompanied by extraordinary mobilization on the right and on the left in American political life. The mobilization of the Black Lives Matter movement around a radical program to transform American life and to tackle racial equalities, all of which these racial equalities have been exacerbated by COVID-19. 
but there is a strong countervailing movement in which whiteness, white supremacy, not diversity, is responding in ways that point to the fragility of American institutional life. These are, com there are comparisons to be made with the mobilization that took place after the First World War, 1914, 1918, and I'm referring here to political mobilization, the period in which the Gavi movement arose. It was also a period marked by the flu pandemic and the war. According to the US National Archives, the virus that is a flu virus infected roughly 500 million people, one third of the world's population, and caused 50 million deaths worldwide, double the number of deaths in World War I. In the United States, a quarter of the population caught the virus. 675,000 people died and life expectancy dropped by 12 years. With no vaccine to protect against the virus, people were urged to isolate, quarantine, practice good personal hygiene, and limit social interaction. Does that sound familiar? The red, black, and green. In so many demonstrations protesting the killing of African-Americans, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, and so many others. The red, black, and green flag of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and the African Communities League was held aloft by activists. In so many meetings held in black communities, these colors are present. They symbolize the impact that Marcus Garvey and the Garvey movement have had on a wide range of movements in the past 100 years. These range from movements for decolonization in Africa and the Caribbean, civil rights and black power in the United States, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and the evolution of Afro-Latin American and Central American anti-racist currents. The important fact is that the UNIA ACL was an organized presence in all these regions in the decades of the 1920s to 50s, in some cases. In looking at Caribbean, the Caribbean impact on the United States, my presentation will mention and cover to some extent people from a wide ideological spectrum. From the communist left, Ferdinand Smith, to Colin Powell in the Republican Party, because the political spectrum of contribution is wide and broad. And we need to think through, especially in these days, coalition politics, coalition building. No single ideological position should exclude others once those others are able to participate in the movement for social justice. So a wide spectrum of Caribbean contribution and none will be left out of this contribution. My emphasis, however, much of the time will be spent in the Gavi movement. And the reason for this is that no one else that I could pick up among Caribbean significant Caribbean contributions to the United States developed a global movement. And a global movement in the 21st century will be imperative if we are to deal with the formidable challenges that we face today. Gabi organized in the United States under three US presidents, Woodrow Wilson, Democrat, who ruled, governed from 1913 to 1921, Warren Harding, short period 1921-23, and Calvin Coolidge from 1923 to 29. Garvey's years in the United States were from 1916 to 1927. He spent most of the last three years in the United States on trumped up fraud charges 
and was deported to Jamaica. J. Edgar Hoover had been working on Garvey's case systematically from 1919. The Garvey movement was an early 20th century response to a number of world historical changes. In the, first of all, in the early 20th century, the consequences of the forced migration of the transatlantic trade and voluntary migration from uh, forced, the forced migration from Africa from the 16th to the 19th century to the Americas were very much evident in the economic impoverishment, political disenfranchisement, and marginalization of Africans and people of African descent. Slavery was not history, it was the present. Many black people living at that time had ancestral memories of enslavement. And the American Civil War in which over 600,000 Americans were killed is testimony to the centrality of slavery in American life. Second world historical factor, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, there is voluntary migration following American capital investments in infrastructure of railroad construction, large scale agriculture in sugar bananas in the Caribbean and Central America. The migration of West Indian labor to build the Panama Canal, the largest infrastructural project of, in its day was significant. Many of these workers went from Panama to settle and work in the United States, and some of them enlisted in the Gava movement. Third historical factor, there was a huge internal migration within the United States from the South to the Midwest industrial cities like Chicago, Ohio to Michigan and the Eastern seaboard cities like New York, Boston, etc. There's also movement to California in the West. Many of Garvey's supporters were migrants. There's a confluence of, I, I call the migration from the South to the urban areas, also a diaspora. And, but I'm noting that there's a confluence of diasporas, a confluence in the cultural interaction between Caribbean migrants and African-Americans learning about each other, not without tension, not without stereotypes as to how African-Americans saw uh, uh, Caribbean people and how Caribbean perspectives of Caribbean people on African-Americans. So tension, contradiction, but at the same time, a confluence in the face of the system of white supremacy. Fourth factor was the political partitioning of Africa. In the late 19th century, around the, in the 1880s with the, at the Congress of Berlin, Africa, Europe carved up the continent of Africa, leaving only Ethiopia and Liberia's somewhat independent states. 20th century Pan-Africanism was a response to these processes. The final factor, two million blacks fought in the First World War, drawn into the French army, drawn into the British army, into the United States army, uh, fighting in Europe, dying in Europe, and returning to face racism in the United States and in the Caribbean. Many of these veterans became frontline fighters for their own rights in the United States and in the independence movements and the trade union movements in Africa and the Caribbean. Garvey's 1917 tour of the United States took him through 38 states and his contact with leaders of the African-American community, intellectuals, religious leaders, business, working class people, industrial workers, convinced him that the time was ready for his message. The UNIA was organized in some 38 countries 
and was very strong in the United States. The divisions in the United States numbered 936. The majority of them, 482 Southern UN, US divisions, making a, a percentage of over 51%. UNIA's strength in the Southern states was a remarkable achievement given the strength of white supremacy and anti-Black segregation policies and practices. Les Payne and Tamara Payne in their National Book Award, The Dead Are Ri Arising, The Life of Malcolm X, provides concrete evidence of the savagery of lynching and arbitrary abuse by whites against Blacks. Describes in Omaha, Nebraska, the way whites would put on blackface and attack white women and the blame would be laid on black men and black men would be selectively targeted to face uh, lynching, beating, and so on. This particular biography of Malcolm X spends a fairly long time discussing Malcolm X's parents and their work in the Garvey movement. Earl Little, Malcolm's father, a native of Georgia, whose parents had been slaves. So, you know, your parents, Malcolm's grandparents are slaves. The slave experience is not historical. It's there in the family. He got married to Louise Langdon Norton, a light-skinned Grenadian who, according to Yann Carew, who first brought this to my attention, Yann Carew, Ghanese writer, uh, they had met at a UNIA meeting in Montreal. This couple helped to build the UNIA in Omaha, ne Nebraska, in Milwaukee, and in Lansing, Michigan, and faced threats of clan violence. The feat of black mobilization in the 1920s faced tremendous odds in a country where civil rights were denied the majority of black people. Malcolm X and his siblings grew up in a hardcore Garvey household. Some of the strong divisions of the UNIA were in the mid-Atlantic. In Pennsylvania, 62 divisions. And give greetings to the people of Pennsylvania who helped to put, the black people who helped to put Trump out of the White House come January 20th. And those in Georgia who are still working on the Senate. But wherever black people were in the United States, the UNIA was organized. And it's a tribute not only to Garvey, but to grassroots people who were able to respond to his message, respond to the organizational outreach, and to develop forms of structures of organization in churches, in communities, in the effort to build schools to educate their children. A wide variety of institutions were created. So Pennsylvania, 62 divisions, New York, 19, New Jersey, 41, the Midwest, Illinois, 26, Indiana, 12, Michigan, 15, including Black Detroit, including Detroit, Missouri, 30, Ohio, 40. In the South, Alabama, 14, Arkansas, Janice Kerner would like to know, 42 divisions, Florida, 30, Georgia, 35, Louisiana, 75, Mississippi, 56, North Carolina, 61, Virginia, 43, West Virginia at that time, 50, and in the south, in the southwest, west, California, 22. In addition, the UNIA was organized in many parts of 
Africa, particularly in Cape Town, in Johannesburg, in Nigeria, in Lagos, in the Gold Coast, in the Gambia, and throughout the entire Caribbean and Central America. So you had structures through which black people on a global basis could respond to what was taking place in the world and would have their say with respect to what was the way forward for their communities. Among the institutions that were important was the Negro World newspaper, which was published from 1918 to 1933. And interestingly, at some point in the publication of this Negro World Weekly, uh, there were sections in French and sections in Spanish, thus speaking to the multilingual nature of our communities and the need to reach out. Then there was the business undertakings, the Black Star Line, important initiative and one of the big mobilizing factors in the spread of the Gaza movement. When people saw those ships coming out of New York, going into Cuba, going into Costa Rica, coming into Jamaica, the, it was a very, a very moving experience because not many people thought that that could be possible. The Negro Factories Corporation and the expansion of the movement in terms of its real estate and the black business enterprises. It is the centenary this year, 2020, of the first convention of the UNIA. The conditions for its growth existed at the level of the increase in racial awareness and the determination to fight against white supremacy. The cultural changes that were taking place among black workers, among black creative people, writers, singers, jazz creators, there was a whole cultural movement which has been documented through the Harlem Renaissance and the role of intellectuals. And this cultural movement is extremely important in us understanding black creativity because that black creativity has been a defining feature of American global cultural impact. And that creativity has been going on 19th century right through to the present time. This period also, the period when the Gava movement arose was also a period in the development of socialist movements in Europe. The movement for self-determination in Ireland, the Irish Re rebellion, the Russian revolution of the 1917 <clears throat> and the rise of working class movements, particularly in Germany at the time that was very strong. Some of Gavi's initiatives and are based on his philosophy to which he expressed in the following way, and I give a quote from his writings, to fight for African redemption does not mean that we must give up our domestic fights for political justice. And this is important because very often the back to Africa doctrine has been interpreted by some as an abandonment of domestic struggles. And this was never the case with the Gave movement. The Gave movement and the people who made it up were involved in the day-to-day -day struggles on the ground in the cities and communities of the United States. They decided which of the dominant parties in the United States they would support on the basis of the ideas and their interests. And in the 1920s, Gave developed the government movement developed the Negro Political Union, which was an initiative to make an assessment of who in the American political process should be supported. 
So there is a relationship between his broader African ideas of African redemption, African liberation, and the struggles where we are. Wherever there was the franchise, Garveyites were active at the local level in politics, putting their demands to candidates, whether of the Republican or Democratic Party in the United States. The most important document in the movement is the Declaration of Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World. And this particular document was drawn up at the 1920 convention at Madison Square Gardens held in New York City in August of 1920. It came out of an international gathering or a convention of delegates from Africa, the United States, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Europe. This was a post-war revival in which the UNIA, which had made a presentation, attempted to make a presentation the year before, 1990, at the Paris conference, peace conference in the United, in, in, in France. And they made nine points in, in that particular conference. And among these were, and just read three of them, the principle of the self-determination be applied to Africa and all European controlled colonies in which people of African descent predominate. That all economic barriers that hamper the industrial development of Africa be removed. That Negroes enjoy the right to travel and reside in any part of the world, even as Europeans now enjoy these rights. That Blacks be permitted the same educational facilities now given to Europeans that Europeans who interfere with or violate African tribal customs be deported and denied re-entry into the continent. That the segregatory and proscriptive ordinances against Negroes in any part of the world be repealed and that they be given complete political, industrial and social equality in countries where Negroes and people of any other race live that the Reservation Land Acts aimed against the natives of South Africa be revoked and the land restored to its prescriptive owners. This is the reparative aspect of the Garvey movement. That Negroes be given proportional representation in any scheme of world government. That the captured German colonies in Africa be turned over to the natives with educated Western and Eastern Negroes as their leaders. These ideas that were taken by the Gabi delegation to Paris were developed in the Declaration of Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World. And central to that was the issue of the franchise, the right to vote. In the 2020 election, we have evidence that 100 years later, that right to vote can still be violated. Very important, the issue of the right to vote, the issue of the democratic vote, the issue of preventing rulers from abusing democratic liberties. The right to education I have, I have stressed and the right to travel, the right to trade and full citizenship rights. When we therefore see the red, black, and green flying in demonstrations as they will continue to fly in 2021, we must remember the global dimension of the struggle around which the Gaza movement was built. Let me turn to the a category that of Caribbean activism that I call anti-fascist and anti-lynching activists. And these are the people who worked in the 1930s and 40s, particularly the 1930s 
around the issue of the anti-fascist struggle against Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini in Europe. And the names that I will mention are names, some of them are familiar, some of them are not. But Paul Robeson, many of you will know. Uh, Paul Robeson was very popular in the independence <laughs> mobilization in the Caribbean. In the late 1940s, 20 to 30,000 people heard him sing in Jamaica, Kingston, and in Trinidad and Tobago. That generation of anti-fascists were global in their perspective. And you don't want any more global activists than Paul Robeson, who spoke so many languages and was such a brilliant, not only singer, but a brilliant mind. And I raise Robeson because, not because he's, he's African-American, but he belongs to a group that included Thurgood Marshall of the NAACP. But those individuals, and Thurgood Marshall was a civil rights lawyer who defended many people. And the person I wanted to, the Jamaican I wanted to highlight was a man called Ferdinand Smith. Ferdinand Smith, 1893 to 1961. And an excellent book has been written about him by Gerald, historian Gerald Horn, entitled Red Seas, Ferdinand Smith and the Radical Black Sailors in the United States and Jamaica. Ferdinand Smith was one of the top leaders of the National Maritime Union of the United States, one of the powerful unions. And he was instrumental in ensuring the war effort. The NMU was instrumental in the efforts to mobilize sailors who went out into the World War II effort in the 1940s. He was also a campaigner for integration for black workers within the maritime union. He, like Paul Robeson, was connected to the American communists. But in the anti-fascist coalition against Hitler and against uh, Mussolini, they were supportive, particularly during the war years of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Smith played a role in defending the interests of workers in the period of the, uh, of the economic depression of the 1930s to ensure that the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt would bring benefit to working class Americans. The National Maritime Union was predominantly a white union, but Smith's brilliance and his political understanding and his trade union uh, intelligence made him a national figure in the United States. He was, he had to leave the United States in the 40s, 50s period because of the emergence of the Cold War and the anti-communism of J. Edgar Hoover. I move, th that group of anti-fascists should include a close friend of Ferdinand Smith, the Trinidad Marxist, Claudia Jones. Claudia Jones was expelled from the United States, but she was very active in civil rights movement anti-racist movements, working class. She went to the, U the United Kingdom where she is the founder of the largest cultural festival in the UK, the Notting Hill Carnival. Why I think the grouping of the anti-fascists are important. 
in the threats now facing the United States and the willingness to resort to political violence. It's important to build and sustain coalitions to defend democratic liberties and rights and for black people to ensure that there are the gains that will be that can be made are protected i find that the period for the of the 1940s 50s tends to be neglected as an area when the global anti-fascist struggle was at the forefront of world politics. I now turn to the more recent civil rights movement and the Black Power movement. And reference was made to Martin Luther King and his role in the anti-poverty struggle. King spent some writing time on about three or so occasions in Jamaica and attended in 1965, the graduation ceremony at the University of the West Indies. And he did a lot of his writing here on the North Coast. And when he spoke in Jamaica in the 60s, 65, he said he felt like a human being here. And one has to give some recognition to the, the way in which, again, there is a linkage with the Caribbean in King's uh, life. Stokely Carmichael and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Stokely Carmichael was born in Trinidad, migrant to the United States. His parents were involved with the Gava movement. And he was involved, as we all know, with the Black Panther Party and later the All Africa People's Revolutionary Party. In the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, he worked with people like John Lewis and others. Stokely Carmichael had a big impact on the movement in the Caribbean, the Caribbean. Black Power Movement, which is associated in large measure with two significant uh, developments in the Caribbean. The 1968 ban on Dr. Walter Rodney, uh, the great Afri uh, Guyanese historian and author of How Africa Underdeveloped Europe. And in Jamaica in 1968, anything to do with black power, the writings of Malcolm X, all of that literature was banned. The banned list under the British was taken over by the new government and added new independence governments and black power literature, all the writings of Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, all of that was prohibited. The 1968 demonstrations in the Caribbean, as well as in the United States, because Walter Rodney did many lectures in the United States with students, community groups, and so on. And then I want to just note that he had a big impact on his native land, Trinidad. And Trinidad had in 1970, 50 years ago, the most consequential black power movement which led the government of Prime Minister Eric Williams to introduce the most radical reforms, developing a state sector in Trinidad and Tobago, in petroleum and in banking. So there is a center dedicated to Stokely Carmichael in Trinidad, which is active among the young people today. Eric Holder, the first Black Attorney General under Obama with Barbadian roots. Colin Powell, the first African American Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of Jamaican origin. All of these are important 
Caribbean diaspora figures who have played important roles in the political order at high levels of the United States uh, government. But it is, there's a special place for Shirley Chisholm, 1924 to 2005. Born in Brooklyn, New York in 1924, spent time in Barbados with her grandmother of Barbadian origin and the first African-American woman in Congress. And she had seven terms and ran for president, the presidential nomination in 1972. And here I must mention her counterpart in literature, Paul Marshall, the African-American novelist with, again, with strong Barbadian origins. Uh, and these two Bayesian women, one a novelist, the other a political figure. Uh, and certainly Kamala Harris has realized Shirley Chisholm's dream. Of significance is that Shirley Chisholm helped to form the Congressional Black Caucus. And the Congressional Black Caucus is an important part of the access that Black people throughout the world have to the American political system, whether from the African side or from the Caribbean or Latin American side. The Congressional Black Caucus and its capacity for outreach and its linkages within the American political system cannot be underestimated because of the import, its importance in the American political system. The Biden-Harris presidency has, will have and uh, already has the, 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 in the many challenges. I've heard President-elect Biden speak that one of the central things that his government will tackle is the inequalities of race. Challenging and taking on the challenges of economic access to jobs, health, as well as to education. This is going to be a tall order and it's going to be up to mass movements to keep the focus on that agenda. Given what we all know from the two terms of Obama, the playbook of the McConnells of this world, the Trumps of this world, that they are going to oppose and frustrate and try to defeat a progressive agenda. This therefore is not only an American issue, but it's also a Caribbean issue. We live the Biden-Harris administration 2021 takes place in different global circumstances. The 21st century has seen so far the emergence of China and India as key players in the global economy. It's no longer a world economy that is dominated by the United States. China has managed, and much of the countries in East Asia have managed COVID-19 much better than the United States and Europe. If you want to talk about global best practices, you can't reference the United States although the United States has the best resource base, the best institutional order, the best of everything. And yet COVID-19 has been handled with a great degree of ineptitude. And there's been a cavalier attitude to basic protocols such as the wearing of the mask. I can say that no Caribbean government has been so cavalier as has been the Trump administration in handling the COVID-19 crisis. Every Caribbean government have been diligent. They have been following the science. They have been trying to get their populations to 
minimize the risk. We can't afford to wait on a vaccination. We have to protect ourselves now the best way possible. I want to say that in the Caribbean, the country that has suffered the most over the most over the past 30 years from the imposition of US punitive measures, over 200 punitive measures from the Trump administration has been the island of Cuba. And when I speak of Cuba, I speak very fondly of West Indian descendants who I know in Santiago, in Havana, in Guantanamo, people who depend on remittances and the Trump administration cut Western Union uh, ability to provide remittances. These, this is different. This is lifeline for many Cuban people. Lifeline for many basic things that people need. And if one is to make any advocacy for me, Cuba comes first. Even in the light of that, Cuba has given nurses and doctors to many parts of the world, not only in the Caribbean, but in Italy at the high point of the crisis, a set of Cuban doctors and nurses went over to Italy. And therefore I am pleading with you on this webinar to please make the effort to ensure that the punishment of black people in Cuba by the US administration doesn't continue any longer. CARICOM governments are looking forward to doing business with the Biden-Harris administration. And this is natural given the devastating economic impact of COVID-19, the impact of climate change on our region, the growing levels of indebtedness and migration policy and looking forward to doing business with other countries in the world, such as China, without a big stick over our backs, as happened during the years of Trump. Thank you. All right, uh, quite a, a masterful uh, presentation. Uh, as expected, uh, Professor Rupert Lewis, Professor Emeritus at the University of the West Indies, a man who brought uh, decades of experience, scholarship, and remarkable work in both academia and activism uh, uh, to the subject uh, this evening. And I think you all will agree with me who are watching this from across the Black diaspora. This is an international audience here this evening that Professor Lewis did do justice to the subject here this evening. Um, there are lots of questions. Uh, I wanna, um, Tina, if we could, um, in fact, uh, begin to line up some of these questions. I will we'll ask the questions. Uh, Tina and I will go back and forth in terms of splitting these questions because we want to uh, do this in an orderly fashion and accommodate as many questions as possible for Professor Lewis here. And uh, one of the first, let's see, uh, one of the first questions, the first question actually came from, um, from Janice Carney, uh, a member of our National Advisory Panel. And it's an important question because it's one that actually I didn't even think about uh, since Professor uh, Lois, uh, you, maybe you can prophesy for, for us and tell us when you look at this age where we are. Janice Carney asked the question. She said, we often get the question about the next Martin Luther King Jr. Is there a younger version of Marcus Garvey that you can identify in the modern era? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I unfortunately or fortunately. Or does it exist in secret? I, I, I don't Are think... we supposed to keep quiet about it? Hush, hush about it. <laughs> <laughs> no. you know, different periods of history throw up individuals. So there is a, there's, I think Gavi is a product of literally the last couple of centuries, somebody who synthesizes a long historical period and gives expression to 
the long range interests necessary for us to emerge and someone who is has the passion and the organizational capacity. I don't think, I think the world goes more into, less into the, that kind of charismatic, all embracing characters, into more empowerment for ordinary people, for leaders in different areas, for a world that and I, I'm, I'm struggling here because there may be a 21st century version, but it's not going to be like a 20th century version. So I don't have the, what do you call it now, the specs <laughs> to detect who that 21st century but it's such a it's, is. It's such a weighty question, though, because uh, it, uh, it, we talk about the next Dr. King, and so, but it's, it's, it's almost as if Gavi occupies almost a separate space. And we don't even, the, the conversation doesn't come up, the next Marcus Gavi. Are, are you suggesting that this era, uh, that was a different era and time, and that we are living in a dispensation where this, th those kinds of leaders would not exist anymore? Yeah, I'm suggesting that it's it's a different era and different leadership types will emerge in the 21st century. Uh, and if you're if you're looking at another Gavi, I would say you're looking at the continent of Africa. Anyone who can make headway with African unity and to include the diaspora. Anyone who can command that, that uh, command the forces that could bring about a greater degree of unity within the continent of Africa around issues of economic development, around issues of peace, given the situation in so many countries with war, among the different ethnicities, uh, the different, the, just the sheer, the, sheer, the sheer diversity, political, religious, and other diversities of the continent. Uh, so the, this, some, Gavi gave us a kind of roadmap with respect to the fact that Black people's strength eventually depends on a strong Africa. That's his basic point. How do you make that? How do you make that come into being? And therefore, a lot of focus will be on Africa and who emerges in Africa, who can take that message and make it practical in the conditions of today. All right. I'm going to have uh, a Tony Patterson ask the next question. Uh, and then, um, and then uh, uh, Jenny has also uh, uh, raised another important issue. I'm going to ask you right after Attorney Patterson's question. Uh, Tina, go ahead. Uh, so the next question comes from Pascal Aze, who is actually the board chairman here on our uh, board of directors of the Pulse Institute. And he asks, in what ways could the internet and the information age have enhanced or impeded the Garvey movement, if they were obtainable in his time? Yes, well, that one is easier to answer in the sense that Garvey was into communication and um, the communication was his main thing, the mastery of the English language, uh, the ability to address people and relate to what they were going through. Um, enhanced communication that we now have certainly would be, would make his global agenda more, uh, more impactful. But again, one has to look at different, a different time frame, uh, different, restrictions 
But the challenge really is with us today with respect to how we use the lies, the technology uh, to further our political ends. And if I may go back to the first question, one of the things I like about Black Lives Matter is their attitude to leadership. Because very often, the attitude to leadership, which from what, what I understand it to be, is that you don't have a single person out there who can be targeted. That leadership is at multiple levels and people ought to be empowered with their own spheres of leadership, which is not to say that somebody won't emerge who can provide a greater scope, greater thing, but I like the idea of leadership in diverse ways, uh, leadership that you can't eliminate by eliminated one or two people. I like the idea also of responsibility, that we share our own responsibilities in the movement and very often not make one person carry the cross. So, that's my small take on both the leadership and technology. Technology is a huge, a huge change, but it, the technology is only part of a, of deeper technological and psychological and scientific changes that are on the way in our world that is going to reshape reality in ways that we don't, can't yet, um, grasp. So the technologies is, and communication thing is, is a subset of a deeper revolution that is taking place in our world. Right. I'm going to save the next question that Jenny's asked to be as we round up our Q&A because I think it's an important question and I want it to be um, in a separate class of its own. Uh, but let's go to the next question. Maxine, Maxine Mickin said, what is the current status of the UNIA? A few years ago, the New York Times wrote that the UNIA was a secret and closely held organization. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah, well, the UNIA exists and I respect those who <clears throat> continue with the legacy. But I always remember, and I had a couple of years spent in the home of Garvey's second wife, Amy Jakes Garvey in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And she recognized that the vehicles for change in the anti-colonial movement had outgrown the UNIA. And therefore in the 1940s, she had this group called the African Study Circle. And she campaigned for nationalist parties because we now had universal adult suffrage and our political parties. So when in the 1930s, Garvey started the School of African Philosophy, it was to train leaders. And it was not necessary to train leaders in only in the UNIA, but future generations have to reinvent the structures through which they work. And in my own view, the UNIA as a structure is, has, has not kept up with the demands of the present time, the period, the post-colonial period, uh, you, you have to now shift gear. And I saw in Amy Jakes Garvey's life, someone who was at the start of the organization, being able to adjust to the new demands of the post-colonial era with new political structures. So whilst I respect people who continue with the UNIA, the world has moved ahead. Interesting. Uh, Tina, uh, the next question. The next question comes from 
Mimi Scheller, and she asks, can we imagine a program along the lines of the so-called Green New Deal that would instead propose a red, black, and green New Deal of reparations and social spending to rebuild resilient and socially just global economies? Thank you very much, Mimi, and uh, I respect your work on the environment. And uh, I, I, I agree my, and affirm what, what you say, both with respect to the environment and respect to um, reparative justice. I look forward to being in touch with you to share your ideas on how we can reimagine the world. And I think her point is very important because how Gavi reimagined is not necessarily that we should be duplicates of what he reimagined, because we are empowered to reimagine, influenced or shaped by his ideas. But the, the, the remit is not necessarily to duplicate. So thanks very much, me, Michelle, for your comments. All right, the next question is uh, from Duane Genus. Uh, says, if Gavi were alive, would he be supportive of uh, the black, li black leadership of today, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, the black leadership in the Democratic Party? Um, I guess, in essence, what would Gavi say of this dispensation uh, when you take into consideration mm -hmm. the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the black leadership in the Democratic Party, and of course, our fight with the party to make it even more inclusive and, 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 and the current state of black leadership as we see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, again, this is a question of imagination, <laughs> uh, a question taking somebody uh, who departed this world uh, in 1940 and now talking 1920. There are two responses I would give. One is the focus Gavi has on the upliftment of black people and of Africa would make him very critical of existing political organizations. It is through critical discussion, critical engagement that we move forward. So my response is, he, if, if we, we look at the black world and I hear and listen to the different assessments made of where black people are in the United States, I'm aware of the issues of incarceration. I think he would be very angry at the state of black life in the modern world. And I include that uh, the post-colonial world, the way we have treated with uh, political independence, uh, post-apartheid South Africa. You can't read Garvey's writings and not be self-critical of our own responsibilities in terms of how do we ensure justice for black people in ways that we now know that justice has been denied. Given the pandemic, we have, it highlights so many things, much more information we have now about how our people live in different parts of the world. So yes, critical engagement with our realities, uh, I would argue would be where Garvey, but also organizations, developing organizational responses, uh, developing or, or, or business capabilities, and a dis dissatisfaction with the way the world is. I want to comment on an aspect here with respect to Africa, Asia. One of the things that Gavi when said- When is finished, might I ask him something? Yeah. One of the things that Gavi said was, Asia, the development of Asia will be followed by the development of Africa. Always saw that China would emerge, that India would emerge. And then he said, after Asia, 
Africa. When you look at it from that general point of view, we are not thinking that way. China has emerged, India is emerging, Africa is not. All right, um, let's see. Uh, the final question here is on the issue of reparations. Uh, Professor Lewis, uh, Janice wanted you uh, to, oh, let me take, well, let's do two more questions. Uh, let's go to um, uh, Patricia Davis. To what extent is this valuable history taught in Caribbean schools? Is it addressed at any level in American educational institution? I mean, that's the nexus we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, my colleague, Professor Varine Shepard is one of our leading advocates uh, critiquing the lack of this kind of information, this kind of knowledge in our schools today. And um, we just have to make a bigger effort. If we're talking about reparation, there is an entire history that we have to learn and our children have to understand for it to be meaningful. If our children, grandchildren are not understanding the wider processes of our history and the need for us to grasp our place in the modern world, which is basically what Gabriel say. You have to, we have to take our place, but to take your place, it means you have to do this and this and this. Somebody who understands power in the modern world and somebody who understands relations between knowledge and power. In that respect, the, I'm part of the National Commission on Repar Reparations in Jamaica, uh, working with the CARICOM Reparations Com Commission. And efforts are being made to ensure that the message on reparation, the message on our history gets out. But it's, it's like you're making an effort but what is required is much greater than the effort that we are making. So let me ask you the final question, Dr. Lewis. Uh, in, in view, in light of what you've said and uh, the significance of your presentation here this evening, uh, do you see uh, Senator Harris's uh, election uh, as, uh, re regardless of, of the intricacies of the politics, do you see her election as an opportunity here uh, for the diaspora, the global black diaspora with uh, the Caribbean world at the centerpiece as an opportunity for us to forge more of this kind of dialogue and, and, and really uh, season upon the, 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 the common issues that bind all of us, you know, in this part of, what do we call it, North America or the Western hemispheres, et cetera. Absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt that her elevation as vice president elect is a important opening for dialogue. At least, you know, sometimes many people are in high office in America don't know where the Caribbean is or don't know the islands that make up the region. At least in Kamala Harris, we have somebody who knows where we are on the map. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a wonderful opportunity. But again, my point here is that Pulse Institute, the organizations that are in existence and who have an anti-poverty agenda, uh, groups in the Caribbean and elsewhere have to become more active with respect to engaging our respective constituencies because political people respond to constituencies. And right. she's going to need the support from all of us. And that support for the changes which she campaigned on and which we will hold the Biden-Harris administration to. But I look forward to more dialogues like this at right. the local level where we and can talk and out of which can come other forms of dialogue where we can think through the way forward for uh, 
our people? Uh, we want people to stay with us, please, because this moment is very important. We have a special presentation for Professor Rupert Lewis. Uh, but before that, we have an announcement uh, to make. Uh, Tina, can you tell them in terms of uh, what the Pulse is now going to do in view of this conversation and the interest that was generated uh, because of uh, Rupert Lewis's keynote here this evening? Sorry, I was muted. So I think that just especially in light of the last question we had and Professor Lewis, what you just said about kind of bringing it all together, we're gonna to be forming a lecture series on this particular subject about the Caribbean region, its influence on American politics and how we can further that into an anti-poverty policy for not just local communities, but you know, uh, that can be replicated you know, in the Caribbean, in other parts of the diaspora where we're dealing with pretty much the same issues. So we're excited to announce that. I know Bankley has a lot more of the details as well, but it's hitting on pretty much everything we just talked about because as much as you know, we know about this particular subject here and there, and of course with you being a subject matter expert on it, we know it exists, but we don't often tie it enough to the communities where it matters. So, you know, even though for, for instance, Detroit is a majority black city here in the United States, maybe it's not looking at anti-poverty policy measures that may work in Jamaica, that may have worked in Barbados, that may have worked in, you know, even um, black diaspora in the UK. So we're going to be doing a lecture series, kicking it off for 2021, especially in light of having Kamala as the vice president elect and with an incoming new administration. Uh, we believe there's a lot of opportunity to really push this issue to the forefront, not just for the next four years, but beyond that. And I don't know if we've ever seen it here in the United States um, rise to that level, but I think that this is the opportunity to push and to demand for that. So we are very excited to be announcing that series uh, upcoming about this very subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and Tina, as Tina mentioned, uh, we, we, the, the lecture series on Caribbean influence on the world and America, looking at the anti-poverty and reparation question uh, we plan to launch that in January 2021, where you know we're hitting the road right away, uh, hitting the ground, and 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 go to work on this uh, over the next four years. Uh, this is our way also of tackling uh, the Biden-Harris administration on, on some serious issues here. And I think uh, Professor Lewis, we're looking forward to uh, the continued engagement with you and the University of the West Indies. In this, uh, you have been a trailblazer. Uh, the work of the Pulse Institute uh, is, um, is followed across the political and economic spectrum. Uh, because of this forum here this evening, uh, when the world went around, uh, this was what came back to us. A special award for you, Professor Lewis. Uh, mm -hmm. This is called the uh, Congressional Record. Uh, and what this says here, let me read it. It says the Honorable Debbie Dingle of the Michigan of Michigan in the House of Representatives, December 2nd, 2020, in recognition of Dr. Rupert Lewis. Uh, Ms. Ms. Dingell says, Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Dr. Rupert Lewis as he delivers the keynote speech at the Pulse Institute Literary Circle Forum. Dr. Lewis's significant academic achievements are worthy of commendation. Uh, this is Professor mm -hmm. Rupert Lewis's entire academic record and decades of scholarship is now in the congressional record in Washington, DC. This appeared in the Congressional Gazette uh, and is now a permanent record in the US House of Representatives presented to you uh, here by the Pulse Institute from Congresswoman Debbie Dingell who represents Michigan uh, in the US Congress. Congresswoman Debbie Dingell is also the spouse of the late John Dingell who was a former Dean mm -hmm. of the US Congress. Uh, these individuals followed the work of the Pulse Institute and when this announcement was made that we were having you here to speak to us, to address us on this very subject matter, uh, they decided that this was an important way to recognize your decades of scholarship across the global black diaspora to now be documented in the US Congress. It is now an official congressional record. I have this also by email and I will send that to you, but this will be in a UPS to you tomorrow at the University of the West Indies. So mm -hmm. we wanted to do this to let everybody see that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is important uh, because this is how we must recognize those who have blazed the trail. And Thank you very I, much. Go ahead, yeah. Thank you very much. This is certainly not what I expected. 
I'm accustomed to doing a reasoning or talking and sharing ideas, but uh, thank you for um, this honor. Um, and I, any honor I get, I also mention my wife, Professor Maureen Warner Lewis, who is really the foremost scholar in our family. I'm the number two. Well, we, we wanted this. I think it's important uh, that your work is documented in the congressional mm -hmm. record. And this is a beautiful way to crystallize that. Tina, you want to make a few remarks? And Janice, I'll, if you want to make a few remarks here. Yes, just uh, congratulations, Professor Lewis. Mm -hmm. On behalf of the Institute, we are honored to have you here tonight. Thank you for your humble sharing of your scholarship, your decades worth of, of knowledge on this issue and bringing it to a wider audience. Um, this is just the perfect time to do it. And, you know, as a historian and a, a fan of history myself, I'm just honored to have you here sharing this with the Institute with um, not just the people here at Detroit, but with people from around the world we have listening in. And I know that they stayed tuned this entire time because they were very interested and honored to uh, share screen space with you. And that's just one of the few uh, benefits of having to share virtual space like this, a larger audience. So again, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And Janice, Bankley, if you all want to say something else, thank you uh, again, Professor Lewis. Uh, Janice, Janice you. want to say something quickly? I just want to say, wow, this has been an amazing hour. I have enjoyed it tremendously and learned so much. I've been taking notes. And uh, I'm just so honored to be here with you. Well, she's a diarist, so it's appropriate doing. for her to take it's amazing. and talk thank about Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Janice Kani. Thank you. Tina, Professor, again, uh, thank you so much for honoring us and accepting mm -hmm. our invitation to be the keynote speaker here this evening. I thought tonight's forum mm -hmm. was excellent, remarkable, and something that is just the beginning of a continued dialogue. And hopefully we can achieve the goals and objectives of what you've raised here through the lecture series that the Pulse Institute is gonna announce this evening. And we are urging everybody to check our website out. We'll be announcing this, um, this series later this evening. And thank you so much all for coming. And again, congratulations, Professor. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, okay thank then. Okay. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Same to you. Yeah.